Don't make me come over there and snatch you up off that couch. It's time for mail call. Welcome to mail call. On the road and freezing my butt off. I'm 9,000 feet above sea level in the Colorado Rockies. Now, about a half mile deep inside this mountain, it's a whole nother story. That's where you'll find the Cheyenne Mountain Air Force Station, or what most of you maggots out there might refer to as NORAD, yeah. Let's go see if there's anybody home. Colorado Springs, Colorado, Cheyenne Mountain. Yes, sir, basic mountain on the outside, but inside is four and a half acres of computerized whoop-ass we use to keep tabs on our airspace, yeah. To get into this top secret facility, you gotta jump through some pretty serious hoops. I was pre-cleared through checkpoint one, but armed security guards ain't gonna just wave your butt on through, so don't even think about trying. At checkpoint two, security gets tighter with screenings and an ID check. Then you gotta hike up the road a piece to the famous tunnel entrance. Cheyenne Mountain Operations Center. This is the only way in, North Portal. Let's go check it out, come on. Now this hole in the mountain isn't exactly the entrance. It's just the entrance to the entrance. Buses, shuttle folks in and out. But I decided to hook it the third of a mile to checkpoint three. Whew. To get inside the nerve center of North America's eye in the sky, you gotta get past checkpoint number three. And then two 25-ton blast doors. They keep the 800 people who work inside protected if the world goes to hell in a handbasket. And I don't get past here without an escort. This is Major David Patterson, and he is the go-to guy for the lowdown on this place. Right, welcome to our facility, Gunny. Thank you very much, sir. What is this? That is one of our 25-ton blast doors. We have three of them inside of our facility, and they offer us a level of protection while we're inside the mountain. Protection from what? From nuclear blasts, seismic activity, or any intruders who may want to come inside of our facility. Have these doors ever been closed in anger? During 9-11, we basically had information that an aircraft was headed to our location. So we did close them for about three and a half hours until we dealt with that threat. Well, I want to see what's inside. Do you mind? Well, Gunny, let's go inside. Come on. Wow. So here it is. You know, what I was expecting when I came in is you walk inside of this little tunnel, and then all of a sudden there's a huge, big cavernous cave with buildings inside but that's not the case. No, Gunny, and that's what most people expect. They expect uh, a cavern, but actually what you've seen are a series of tunnels. Now, behind that wall there are 15 independent buildings. 12 of those buildings are three stories high. The other three buildings are two stories high. There's over 200,000 square feet of office space in our facility. And believe it or not, the whole doggone shebang floats above the cave floor. Gunny, before we go in, I wanted to show you the real Colorado Springs. This is what our buildings sit on. There's 1,319 springs that sit on all 15 independent buildings. Now, what the springs allow the buildings to do is to absorb impact of a nuclear blast or seismic activity. The buildings will move one foot in any direction for seismic activity or that nuclear blast. Well, how cool is that? People out in California could take a couple of lessons from you guys, huh? They could. This is as good a time as any to answer an email from Bob in Dallas, Texas. He's asking, why do we need this kind of secure underground facility? Well, Dimwit, we got a hell of a lot of heavy-duty action going on inside these walls. Cheyenne Mountain is the epicenter for a worldwide network of satellites, radar, and sensors. Watching over North America 24-7. Everything that flies from zero to 50,000 feet anywhere near our airspace can be monitored right from here. Our job here is to take information that we get from various sensors, spaceborne, ground sensors, intel sources, and things like that, and really uh, try and take that information and fuse it here and try and decide whether or not it constitutes uh, a threat to North America. And then our job is to turn around and decide who needs to know that information. If you're wondering why the head honcho today is Canadian, well, that's because Cheyenne Mountain is a binational command. The U.S. and Canada work this post together to keep all of us safe.
regardless of where you're from, either Canada or the United States, or what service, to make sure that we, we can continue on a daily basis to understand that we're same team, same fight, we dress alike, and we wear the same patches. I was here on the morning of 9-11, and when everybody was working together that terrible morning, you couldn't tell the difference between Canadians and Americans, or the different services. Everybody was pulling together and getting the job done. I like that, sir. The idea of having a safe and secure base of operations to protect North America against air threats started way back in 1956. That was the height of the Cold War. Back then, we were scared, and rightly so, about a little something called the H-bomb. The Ruskies were building missiles with nuclear warheads at a pretty good clip and marching them around Red Square on a regular basis. And when they weren't being paraded in front of the Soviet leaders, they were being pointed directly at us. Back in 1957, Russia launched Sputnik 1. The world's first artificial satellite was only about the size of a basketball and weighed just about 183 pounds. But the message was clear. Pretty quick, the Soviets were going to be able to send a nuke-tipped missile between continents. And the continent that they seemed to favor was ours. Now, the U.S. Defense Department wasn't just about ready to lay down and kiss our butts goodbye. They had to figure out a way to keep tabs on a growing missile threat half a world away. That's how the idea of a North American Air Defense Command came into being. And in 1958, the bill to create NORAD was signed into law. And then that thing called the Cuban Missile Crisis came along right quick to remind us that we needed to get on the stick. With nukes so close to our shores, the plan to build the command center for NORAD deep inside Cheyenne Mountain seemed like a real good one. Even if America was digging out from a nuclear attack, we'd still have a safe place for the leadership to work and get us back on track. So, how did we build this place? Well, that's the email question from Sandy in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Well, Sandy, the Army broke ground at Cheyenne Mountain in 1961. And I do mean broke. It took a year to blast 920,000 tons of granite from inside that mountain. Instead of one big cavern, they dug out a series of seven intersecting chambers that are each about the size of one or two football fields and about three stories high. Once the chambers got blasted, it was time to call in the United States Navy. Sailors are good at erecting giant things out of sheet metal. So, maybe it's no coincidence that the buildings inside Cheyenne Mountain look like battleships setting in a cave. Altogether, the Navy built 15 freestanding steel buildings that don't make contact with a rock wall. And everything was designed for survivability in the event of Armageddon or something like that. For a start, they installed those three and a half foot thick blast doors. They can close automatically in 30 seconds, but can also work manually. And when I got a demo, I had to step in and help them out. They say it takes two men to do this. Only one Marine. <laughs> See, some of you guys tried that. Getting the doors open again is usually not a problem. But if there is, we found the plan B emergency exit. Now, if something goes wrong with the blast doors, well, there's only one way out of here. It's the escape hatch, right here. Special tools in here can get this hatch open in no time. And it's a 100-foot crawl to the outside tunnel. Boy, and this is where you come out. This is the main tunnel. Wonder where the, where the guys are. Inside, they say that with all this gear in place, you got about a 70% chance of surviving a five megaton thermonuclear device. Not bad odds, considering the rest of the world was still doing duck and cover when Cheyenne Mountain opened for business back in 66. So now that we got a good idea how they got this place going, I want to take you inside to see the heart of the operation. That's coming up next. Stay where you are. Bail Call is going to be right back here on the History Channel. All right, welcome back to Mail Call. Well, I'm checking my email here, and I got one from Justin in Kaiser, Oregon. 
Hey, Gunny, can I get an inside look at how NORAD tracks aircraft coming into the United States? Well, heck yeah, Justin. I'm inside the heart and soul of America's air defense right now. This is the Air Warning Center. And when you disorganized pukes say NORAD, this is the room you're talking about. Technically, the NORAD Battle Management Center. Here at NORAD, we watch aircraft by exception. And we try and build a coherent story so that the command director or the commanding general, or at sometimes even the secretary of defense or the president or prime minister themselves can make an informed decision. We can bring up uh, various conference calls on our, our phones here with just the touch of a button that get all these personnel on the same line. And sure enough, while we were in the air warning center, they had what they call an incident of concern. Today, what we're focusing on is uh, air traffic across the United States because we had a report of a uh, unruly passenger on a commercial airline. This passenger had gotten a uh, pushing contest with one of the flight crew members, so they restrained him. And the Federal Aviation Administration has not requested military assistance at this time, but we are watching this plane until it's safely on the ground in case they do want assistance. What is this here? This is. Uh, this aircraft was going into JFK, and uh, so it's a zoom into uh, New York City. So you wow. can see, <clears throat> this is mostly commercial air traffic that you're seeing, and you can, you can watch the whole world, or you can zoom in to an area of concern. So as oh, I said, oh. the, uh, the aircraft that we were concerned about was uh, traveling overseas, and it just landed there in New York. Okay. And notice, no blaring sirens, no DEF CON alert warning. This ain't Hollywood. It's professionals keeping an eye on everything that goes on and responding by the book. We're pretty well protected here, aren't we? Oh, we are. We have various bases on alert, fighter bases, and, and uh, fighter pilots are sitting at alert around they can the scramble clock. scramble at, at the drop of a hat. They'll be up in no time. Four Air Force personnel man the AWC. Round the clock, every day of the year. There's also Army guys and even Marines here doing something called consequence management. That is in case there's an incident with chemical, biological, or radiological weapons. And the Air Warning Center isn't the only place around here with the eagle eye. Somewhere in this maze of hallways, there's also the Missile Warning Center. This is where we keep track of every missile launch worldwide. Now, if somebody sends up a scud, or worse, the Seems Missile Warning Center sees it first. But we won't see it, because all that stuff is strictly classified, and as soon as our cameras get near it, the data just disappears. We see missile launches from, uh, from infrared. They ship the data to us. We see it on our computer screen, which are classified right here. And then uh, we, we send that out to warn, to warn people what's going on so they can, they can fight the war as they need to. Also in this complex is the Aerospace Warning Center, where they're tracking everything in orbit, from satellites to a bolt that fell off the space station. But they wouldn't let us in there. So instead, I decided to check out how they keep all this technical stuff up and running. And that meant a trip even deeper into the bowels of Cheyenne Mountain. I haven't seen this much conduit since I tried to hook up my cable modem. The whole basement of this, this mountain supports the, the mission that, that we're up to upstairs. That's exactly what it does. They couldn't do their mission without us here. Yeah. And how many people do you have working down here that maintain this complex? We have a total of 550 people that provide the communications and engineering and security for this mountain. The air we're breathing in here comes from outside. Giant vents sucking in and 21 NBC filters keep it free from nuclear, biological, or chemical contaminants. Power comes from the city of Colorado Springs. But if the city goes dark, Cheyenne Mountain won't. There's enough backup generators here to power the mountain for a year, fueled by more than a million gallons of diesel fuel stored in a protected reservoir. And speaking of reservoirs, water ain't no problem either. When they blasted into this mountain, they found a spring that got just 30,000 gallons of fresh water every day. This is our reservoir area, and this is where we contain our industrial water that we use to cool the complex 
as well as cooling the generators. The water's right there. The water's right here, four and a half million gallons. This is our industrial water. The next added down houses our domestic water and another million and a half gallons of that. Can we go up there? We can go up there. Hey, look, there's a duck out there. Yeah, that's our industrial area mascot. Your mascot? Should have brought the shotgun. How far does this go back? It goes back 200 feet. It's about 20 feet deep. That's kind of hard to tell on camera just how big these reservoirs are. So I decided to skip a couple of rocks to give you a better idea. Good skipper, huh? That was about a sick skip. But enough dilly-dally and I got bigger fish to fry. So where's that famous room with the giant computer screens that gives you a bird's eye view of impending doom? The war room. Well, I'm supposed to meet up with the big head honcho around here to show you people what it's really like in there. So stick around. Did I say you could get up? I don't think so. We got a lot more mail call coming up right here on the History Channel. Welcome back to Mail Call. Behind this door is the war room at Cheyenne Mountain, what they call the command center. Everybody thinks that this is where you're gonna find the big jumbo map and the red phone. So let's just find somebody that's got a key around here so we can crack this bad boy wide open. Maybe I can just do it myself. Maybe there's an alarm. I'll find somebody with a key. Hooking up with somebody to get me into the command center means I gotta hump it through the maze of hallways here. And I do mean maze. Now they tell me that these buildings were designed to be confusing to outsiders. So security can get to you before you get to any of them. Along the way, there's a whole lot of places that are so top secret, they won't even tell the gunny what's going on inside. But one door is always open to the gunny, and it leads right to the chow hall. Num num. Check out the chow. Can't go wrong with this. And if you just happen to have maybe got a little too much of that chow, you might just add the gym to your tour. All right, now, back on the trail of the war room. Now, this is what I'm talking about, the guy with the clout and the code to get me into the command center. Vice Commander Brigadier General Jim Hunter. Now, we've gotten sneak peeks at what's inside the command center at Cheyenne Mountain before. Every decade or so, the military would release some film of their big maps, really big maps, and the best electronic bells and whistles they could come up with. So when I stepped into the 21st Century Command Center, I was expecting a jumbotron or something. Well, it wasn't exactly what I expected, and there's two reasons for that. First off, you don't need a big map with little pins all over it when your computer is directly connected to satellites, radars, the Pentagon, the FAA, and just about anything else you can think of. And also, before they let me in here, the room was what they call scrubbed. That means they turned off everything that might compromise national security, and that was all right with me. The team that works in here takes what they do real serious. In fact, they don't even leave the room to take a break or eat lunch. They spend their whole shift watching and waiting. I asked the general what they're watching for with commercial jets. If the airliner is, uh, you know, is, is not acting particularly funny or there's been a lack of radio contact, we'll just watch it, for example. However, if there's indications of a hijacking through the transponder codes that are issued from the airplane or possibly radio transmission or cell phone telephone calls from the passengers, then we'll get there really quickly, obviously. You may even scramble. Yes. before you exactly. reach up to the higher-ups? The order can be given at a very low level to get the jets airborne. It's the engagement order that's at a very high level, and that's what you're alluding to here. Right. I asked the general about the protocol for something like the incident that we had that morning. It comes to our attention. Uh, there's nothing going wrong with the airplane. It's still on course. The pilots are saying everything's under control. We'll just keep an eye and make sure that that airplane lands safely, for example. Nothing happens here. The command director's made a decision that the seniors in the chain of command or the government didn't need to know about that one. That happens often on a daily basis here. After 9-11 happened, how did your mission change here? 
The mission didn't so much change as expand. Prior to 9-11, NORAD was always looking out from North American airspace, looking for bad people that were trying to come in, people that didn't belong in our airspace. After 9-11, of course, we became much more interested in the internal airspace of North America as well. So our mission expanded to, to start covering that. We, we became much more closely allied with the Federal Aviation Administration and its counterpart in Canada called NAVCAN, so that we're much more up on what's going on on a literally minute-to-minute -minute basis. If something starts happening out there, we're aware of it and we're able to start taking action much sooner. I was blown away when I found out from the general that since 9-11, fighter jets have flown more than 27,000 sorties to deter, prevent, and defend us against potential terrorist threats. They truly are the watchdogs of the United States Air Force. Wasn't that neat? That was the command center. We got to go in, we got to look around. A little bit cramped, a little bit antiquated, maybe. So the general has authorized me the special privilege of having a good close look at the brand new command center. Now this is more like it. Upgraded computers and communications gear, a better setup for the people dedicated to our safety 24-7, 365. Hoorah! You know, working in that mountain, long shift, no daylight, America's security in your hands, that's a tough job. But the men and women of Cheyenne Mountain are getting it done every day. They are the guardians of the high frontier. No question about it. Simplify, carry on. American mercenaries battled the Japanese in the skies over China. Now, computer-generated footage recreates their legendary aerial encounters as the P-40 flyers turn their skills and strategy into adrenaline-driven split-second action. The Flying Tigers on Dogfights, tonight at 9 on the History Channel.